Uh, so Nick, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was at the summit in Southeast Asia uh, this week, and some uh, remarkable video just came out of that. Uh, Trudeau addressed uh, with China's President Xi Jinping uh, allegations of foreign interference in our elections. Uh, and I, I just want to play you this clip. Everything we discuss is then leaked to the paper. That's not appropriate. And that's not all the way the, the conversation was conducted. If there is... If in there Canada, is sincerity we in on your part, free and open and frank dialogue, and that is what we will continue to have. We will continue to look to work constructively together, but there will be things we will disagree on, and we will have to continue. Let's create the conditions first. Uh, for for those listening to the podcast, I, I don't know. Do you do you want to describe what you saw uh, in that clip, Nick? Well, we saw uh, the Prime Minister of Canada and the President of China having a little chit chat. Um, but the body language was actually quite telling. It was pretty clear that, uh, that you know, the President of China is kind of like, you know, it's like when you talk to someone, then you're trying to leave. He's like, mm -hmm. trying to leave, right? Like to end this conversation. And uh, Justin Trudeau with uh, laser like eyes trying to engage the uh the, the president of China, who on many occasions didn't even look at the prime minister of Canada. So I thought it was I thought it was quite awkward. It speaks to the awkward relationship and the awkward diplomacy that we're having right now uh, between uh, Canada and and China. So yeah. not a big not a big surprise. But yeah, awkward is probably Very, yeah. sums it up. So I think I think you know the, the allegations again are, are 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 well our our own spy agency CSIS is saying that China has attempted to meddle in in our elections. This was raised uh, with China at the summit, and then uh, it, it was publicized. And uh, obviously, President uh, Xi Jinping was was unhappy with that, and Trudeau pressed his case in person. So I, I guess the debate uh, going around now, Nick, is, is was this sort of a power play by Canada, or was it just sort of optics at, at this point? And, and, and do Canadians, are, are Canadians really paying attention to this? Well, I would never use the word power play in Canada-Chinese relations because we have no power, realistically, mm -hmm. over China. Uh, China is a superpower. Canada is not. I, I would I would say it's more posturing than uh, than a power play and probably posturing more towards a, a domestic audience. I'm not sure how that interchange is going to help Canada-China China relations get back on track or why don't we say go from frosty to cold? Um, and you know, the reality is, is, uh, Trudeau didn't even rank a meeting, you know, mm -hmm. he had to buttonhole him, uh, wandering around <laughs> during the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and the other interesting thing, um, I may be perhaps the good news for the liberals, at least, is that when we asked Canadians in a recent survey that we did for the Globe and Mail, we asked Canadians, you know, which regions or countries should be the top priorities for closer ties. At the top of the list is the U.S. at 52%, Europe at 25%, Indo-Pacific, excluding China, 5%, China, 3%. So if you're an average Canadian, you're probably thinking our priority for closer ties really should be the United States, you know, much more mm. important than the Indo-Pacific, which is where there's a new uh, strategy that's being uh, rolled out, uh, or, uh, or Europe, and that uh, China, Indo-Pacific, just not as important as a top priority for closer relations. So even if uh, the prime minister is sort of playing to a, to a hometown crowd, let's say, uh, in, 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 in this, um, you're saying that only 5%, 3% of Canadians uh, actually care about our relations with, with uh, Southeast Asia and China? Well, it's not that they don't care, right? They obviously, Canadians know that China especially is an extremely important country, both from an economic and a security perspective. Uh, around the world. But as a priority for Canada, it's kind of like China's just not at the top of the list. Only 3% mm. of Canadians believe that it should be the top priority. And, you know, just to put it into context, 52%, you know, so more than 15 times more likely to say that the U we should be focusing on the US or eight times more likely to say mm. we should be focusing on Europe compared to China. So I guess, uh, I, I guess we can have those frosty relations because can Canadians at least don't really see it as a top priority. Mm -hmm.
Uh, speaking of the United States, uh, just you know, keeping in in, in topic, Nick, uh, I don't think uh, the U.S. president has has visited us uh, yet. Uh, is is that true, or is my memory faulty? No, he hasn't visited, and I, you know, but I think they talk about a visit every time. Uh, every time Trudeau meets Biden, they talk about a visit. Hmm. It's kind of like one of the, you know. Here's how about this? You know, this is another situation. You know, it's it's kind of like. Uh, you know, one of those friends that say, you know, we should get together. Yeah, let's get together. And then it never, ever happens. And there's nothing <laughs> I, yeah. nothing ever initiated. So it's kind of like, yeah, you know, Biden has, has kind of visited a number of uh, key partners around the world, trade partners and security partners. Um, Canada just hasn't been on the list. And, you know, this is in contrast to, to, to most other U.S. presidents who come to Canada to visit because Canada is like an easy lift. It's close. It's safe. It's friendly and we're not controversial. So, you know, usually new presidents come to Canada because it's a it's a good place to have a first uh, foreign visit that is, uh, you know, a f- fairly easy to kind of get through. But, you know, for Biden, I think the fact that he uh, hasn't shown up, uh, hasn't had a visit uh, is, is probably another indicator of uh, of our standing, at least, or the kind mm. of state of our relationship. Maybe it's not as great. As uh, as at least the survey results, Canadians would like to have a strong relationship with the U.S. Well, maybe it's not as strong as it has been in the past under previous prime ministers. Well, Nick, we've got sort of uh, chilly, rocky, uh, you know, use your adjective relations abroad. And then and then at home in Canada, our, our own governments can't really get along. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, tension, I guess, between the federal government and the provinces. Uh, we're in the middle of a, a healthcare crisis, but especially here in Ontario, we've got a sort of a triple threat of child cases and RSV, COVID, and the flu. And the healthcare ministers could not come up with a with a breakthrough in healthcare funding, uh, which seems to be a, a major problem. Yeah, what's quite interesting is you know healthcare still remains you know in the top three issues of concern that uh, people have, but you know people are outright worried. It's not just the the. This, these outbreaks among uh, young kids. We, But I think we do have to say, because I was looking mm-hmm. at the numbers on this, it looks like it's just a number of cohorts that are, I guess this is something that regularly happens within a certain age cohort among young people. Mm-hmm. And during the pandemic, there weren't really any major outbreaks. So this could just be catching up. Kind of like, do you remember when they eliminated grade 13 and there were two hor- cohorts to graduate? I do so in Ontario, yeah. yeah. So we have to be a little careful mm-hmm. in uh, portraying this as an outbreak. Is it an outlier? Yes, but it could just be people kind of uh, two cohorts graduating at the same time uh, on the uh, on the exposure front. But that being said, our emergency rooms across the country are, are under stress. Health is underfunded. We're trying to get through this this uh, surge in uh, in kind of respiratory illnesses among young people, and it's like nothing's happened. You know the the provinces are asking. The federal government is quasi engaging. And uh, there's a there's a lot of unrest, hmm. uh, you know, right across the country, especially also in in Ontario. Uh, there's this other big uh, big story out of Ontario recently, where, where Ontario Premier Doug Ford uh, uh, pushed uh, through legislation or, or table legislation to force, I think, fifty five thousand education workers back to work. Uh, this would have used the notwithstanding clause uh, to override the charter, which you know became a major political point. Uh, Trudeau weighed in on this. Um, eventually, there was a lot of backlash and Ford uh, withdrew the bill. Um, but it had a, a very curious impact on support for the uh, federal parties. Yeah, it's what's interesting. So think of it this way. Ford d- literally drops the legislative hammer mm-hmm. on uh, on the uh, education workers. And then uh, after a couple of days, kind of recoils and, you know, lifts it back. Mm. Um, what's interesting is, you know, because we're, we're po- we poll every week, basically every day uh, on the federal scene. And, and one thing that we did see, and Michael, if we can uh, share the trend line on this, uh, this is a trend line of uh, federal party support in the province of Ontario. So it's not provincial, it's federal. Mm-hmm. But check this out. You can see a massive decline in like a double digit decline in federal conservative party support in, in Ontario. Wow. Coincidental with all of this stuff happening with Ford. It had nothing to do with Pierre Poiliev doing anything uh, or being controversial about anything. Uh, the only thing that was really in the news is the Ford government. What this suggests 
is that perhaps there's a relationship uh, for the Conservatives between what happens in Ontario and at least the federal numbers in Ontario. And that would mean that uh, Pierre Poiliev might not be a master of his own destiny. That, you know, if the Ford government does well, that'll bode well for Pierre Poiliev and the competitiveness of the Conservatives. But if the Ford progressive Conservatives in Ontario hit turbulence, that might be, there could be some backlash uh, or fatigue uh, that uh, rolls over to the federal mm. level. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but this this seemed to have happened when when Aaron O'Toole was leader of the Conservatives, and 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 we had an election uh, last federal election, and I believe uh, Doug Ford sort of uh, you know was uh, not not public. Let's say he I don't want to say he went into hiding or something, no, but but no. he wasn't you know uh, in front of yeah low key, say low, key. That's low key low yeah. key let's say low key. <laughs> Well, many times premiers tend to be low key during uh, federal elections mm. uh, anyways, because they don't want to interfere in the same way they get upset when federal party leaders, uh, when they're not invited, we should say, mm. uh, intervene in provincial elections. But, you know, I think the key takeaway here is, you know, if you're a federal conservative, you're thinking, why did our numbers go down that week? Mm. We didn't do anything wrong. Didn't mess up. There's no controversy, no scandal, no nothing. And then it'd be like, well, hey, you know, for some Canadians, especially in Ontario, they make the connection. So, you know, I guess what I want to put on the table is, is that there could be a relationship between the success of Doug Ford and potentially the success of Pierre Poiliev, that if on in vote rich Ontario, which the Conservatives must win in order to get the upper hand in the House of Commons, mm. uh, if, the, if, if Ford's in trouble, that might just not be great news for uh, for the federal conservatives. Uh, Nick, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to see what the federal parties can learn from the U.S. midterm results. Super. Uh, so, Nick, the U.S. midterm results uh, may have been a surprise to some. The Democrats uh, maintain control of the Senate. Uh, but here in Canada, uh, I'm curious what the Liberals and the Conservatives can can take away from uh, from the successes of of uh, their American counterparts. Well, they, I'll call it the political junkies that make up the leadership for the major parties are reading lots of entrails as to what happened in the United States and what it might mean. You know, for the Liberals. I think they might be looking at the Democrat strategy. What's interesting about the Democrat strategy is that when we look at the exit polling and the profile of individuals that voted, what's very clear is that women were highly motivated by the abortion issue, but that young people, above average number of young Americans ended up voting. And we know that uh, for them, uh, this whole Biden promise on the tuition front uh, was important. So think of for the liberals, you know, when they're kind of the mad scientists in the liberal campaign trying to figure out how to motivate voters, they might be looking at issues like this and trying to replicate them for the uh, for the next liberal campaign. And for the conservatives, they got to be looking at it and going, OK, so, you know, the Republicans did do a pickup in the House of Representatives, which is good, uh, not as much as the Republicans wanted. But uh, I think perhaps the lesson for the for the conservatives would be you know, to make sure that the Conservative Party does not go too far to the right. Uh, mm. Because what looks like what happened is that, you know, for some Americans, they were just fatigued, especially with the election deniers and uh, and those other types of, I'll call it Trump elements, mm. uh, that basically uh, stemmed what should have been a red tide, a red Republican tide mm -hmm. in the U.S. election. And we we talked about this before, Nick. Uh, you said that in Canada, sort of practical-minded conservatism seems to do well these days, uh, like the Doug Ford government, or uh, uh, or or in Quebec as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that's, and you know we we you know in the previous segment we talked about uh, you know Doug Ford dropping the hammer on uh, and with the notwithstanding clause on education workers. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is he reversed himself. It's kind of like, remember during the pandemic, you know, at some point, I think cops were going to be out on the street to stop people. Uh, and then he reversed himself very quickly. So, you know, that's the pragmatism that yes, you know, he, he did kind of, he did kind of move forward on a particular action, but then when people reacted very negatively to that, 
to uh, to the Ford movement, um, he basically backed out. Hmm. So, uh, and I and I think in those particular situations, people see okay, well, um, at least he's not kind of what I'll say strictly ideological uh, or narrowly focused. He, there is some hmm. flexibility there. Uh, and to backtrack, you also uh, said that the Democrats uh, really benefited from uh, Biden's uh, student debt relief uh, policy, and 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 I'm wondering if, uh, as you suggested, maybe the Liberals will 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 take a similar idea from that for for Canada. But but it it reminds me of uh, something that sort of went horribly wrong in in Quebec in a in a certain Quebec election uh, yeah. campaign. Yeah, hor- horribly wrong for the uh, Parti Québécois. If you mm-hmm. remember, there was. There was the uh, famous little historical footnote, a famous election in provincial election in Quebec, where actually one of the key issues uh, had to do with tuition. And uh, at that time, the Parti Québécois government uh, looking to uh, increase tuition rates in Quebec, which are very low, like Mm. from low to still low. How's that? Why don't we just say it's not like the same level we see in other parts of the country. But at that point, uh, students were out banging pots. Literally banging pots, yep. protesting the uh, protesting the Marwak government, and the other thing is, is PQ lost that election. The other thing is, is from and it'd be interesting to see if any of our listeners or viewers can find another stat. But as far as I can see, that specific provincial election had the highest level of turnout among young voters compared to any other provincial or federal election, and I think it had to do with the fact that there was a concrete issue on the table that directly impacted the lives of young people that they were highly motivated for and they came out and vote, voted. And that's what we saw the Democrats do. So it'll be interesting for both the Conservatives and the Liberals to figure out whether they can identify those hot button issues that might motivate young people to get out and vote and then to vote for either the blue team or the red team, depending on what that big hot button issue might be. Mm. Uh, Nick, I think we'll leave it there for this episode. Uh, and, And as always, thanks everyone for watching and listening.